Fox 25 Boston and a world-class hacker by National Geographic Breakthrough Series and described as a paunchy hacker by Rolling Stone magazine. He, however, prefers if people refer to him simply as a hacker, helper, and human. Uh, I've seen Jason before, and I wouldn't necessarily call him paunchy, but okay. Uh, Jason is the chief chaos officer of TrueSec, a global cybersecurity solutions provider, the author of Dissecting the Hack series, which is currently required reading at five colleges in three countries that he knows of. Jason is also the DEF CON Group's global ambassador, which we thank him for. He's spoken at DEF CON, DEF CON China, GRR CON, Derby CON, and several other cons and colleges on a variety of information security subjects. He is also a guest lecturer for the Beijing Institute of Technology for 10 years. He loves to explore the world and networks as much as he can. He has successfully robbed banks, oh, that's interesting, hotels, government facilities, biochemical companies on five continents, only successfully robbing the wrong bank in Lebanon once. All others were uh, others he was supposed to. He is highly carbonated speaker who has partaken of pizza from Bulgaria to Brazil and China to the Canary Islands. Jason was proud to be chosen as one of Time's Persons of the Year for 2020 or for 2006. So everybody, uh, welcome Jason to the stage. He's going to be given our keynote address. Take it away, Jason. Right, thank you for having me. Uh, X-ray, that was a wonderful bio. I didn't think I was going to actually do the uh, actual bio, but uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, Thanks everyone for uh, being here in, in real life and uh, online. Um, and so this is a different kind of talk because, you know, I didn't want to do the slides. And so it's going to be sort of ranty, uh, but it's also going to be something that I think, uh, especially with some of the issues that we're having that we need to address. Um, hold on, I've got to wait for that. I love when that little voice comes in. Okay. so. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, a couple of things, uh, but I want to address it as a whole. Uh, if you don't know uh, much about me, uh, and trust me, that bio sounds way cooler than I am, uh, I'm the Deaf Country's Global Ambassador. So that means my job is to go around, I go to conferences all over the world, I talk to different Deaf Countries. I've helped start Deaf Countries in China, Singapore. Uh, I was in Marrakesh, Morocco in June and actually helped start the Deaf Country there and also one in the Congo. Uh, so um, I love going out there and talking about what we can do with Deaf Country. And I have a very distinct view of how I see the world and how I see hackers within the world. Uh, I did a talk at Deaf Country 22 uh, about uh, the hacking culture and what it means to be a hacker and how different societies and different cultures uh, look at hackers and how we can start changing that. Uh, but today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, something that I'm starting an issue that we're starting here at Duck Country. It's like a little uh, uh, tagline that I'm trying to get uh, going on some shirts and everything. I want to talk about tribe. It's like I want to talk about our tribe. Um, I promise it's like because uh, one of the things is like I, I want to uh, and to do that. It's like I want to start talking a little bit about ethnicity. It's like, uh, I mean, I'm not going to talk about race because, you know, made up construct by old Europeans to make themselves feel about, about only other people back in the uh, in the olden days. And it's like, because race is about division. We're talking about that. That is how the divide. Ethnicity is how we're included. It shows how we are a part of something. And so my viewpoint and the way that I look at things and the way I look at the world is like, I've always done research. I've always like things that I'm curious about. I want to know exactly how it works and what it does. So one of the things that I've come across is like as I travel, first of all, you ain't that special. It's like, and I mean, every one of us, everybody keeps telling me like, is it harder to rob a bank in, in this country? Or can you break into places in this country? Because they do, no, it's human nature. I have never met a foreigner in my life. And I've been to over 50 countries. It's like, when you come down to it, Human nature is human nature. And so one of the things that I've developed in my way of thinking uh, about ethnicity and about how we are as hackers is that there are two subgroups and then one primary ethnicity. It's like a, how you define yourself. Because to try to narrow yourself and limit yourself by saying, 
you're a white guy in America, it's like, that means you're the same as the Ivy League professor in Boston. It's like, you know, the TV producer in California or that guy on the, on the lawnmower in Florida. You know, it's like, no, that doesn't, that's not the same groups that I'm in. That's not my ethnicity. Those are all different cultures in there. It's like, so there's, the way I look at it, it's very simple. You have your geographical ethnicity, which is a sub-ethnicity. You have your social ethnicity, which is, you know, your moral and stuff. And you have your uh, cultural ethnicity, which is your primary, where you find your tribe. So for me, just to just try to be able to explain it is, I'm from Houston, Texas, born and raised, and I'm from Southern Texas. So, so that means that I know how to say the street Kirkendall. Because if you look at it on the sign, it does not look like it's spelled Kirkendall. Okay, I don't even think there's an R in the thing. It's like people are like, where are you getting Kirkendall from? It's Kirkendall. Just shut up and just accept it, okay? And trust me, and there's quite a few places of people in Boston that are local. Because some of those things like whoosh, 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 yeah, whatever, okay? That's because that's their local ethnicity. That's their geographical ethnicity. They get those inside jokes. You get those inside things from, so that means if you're anywhere in the world and you see someone that looks different from you, it's like you may think different from you, but if you see that they're wearing a shirt from your hometown or the hometown college, you're going to instantly feel that connection because they're part of your sub-ethnicity. They're part of your local ethnicity. Like, oh, you are, you're not as a stranger as I would think because you're part of one of my subgroups. So we have a connection. Now the social ethnicity and our moral ethnicity, that is more of like how we equate with like politics. It's like how we uh, feel about, you know, our morals and our upbringing and our fiber and, and ethics and stuff. That's what we, so that means if you see someone somewhere else in the world and they may have a, a, a different uh, shirt on from a different part of the world or something like that, or you know that they're not from your hometown, but if you see that they got a shirt on that says that they're endorsing one candidate or one football team, or something, like, something that you identify with, guess what? That's a connection. That is because they hit your social sub-ethnicity. And so therefore it's like, oh, I know these. This is, he's part, he's part, he's part, he belongs in my group. Now, here comes the big one. The cultural identity, your cultural ethnicity. That's your tribe. That's who you belong to. That's who you, you when anywhere in the world, no matter what that person's political beliefs are, no matter where they come from, what invisible line on the map dictates who we're supposed to like or not like by our government, it's like, it doesn't matter. If they are part of our group, of your cultural uh, primary ethnicity, they're part of your tribe, they belong. And I don't just mean like hackers, because hackers are my tribe. It's like, if you were like all about outdoors, if you just love boating, if you just love going and, and going outdoors, well, guess what? You're out in the woods and you see someone in trouble. It's like, you know, working on a campsite or needing a little bit of help. And it's like, and they may not look like you and you know, they don't pray like you or they don't vote like you, but mother, they're your tribe and you're gonna help them out because that's your ethnicity. That's your primary directed thing. This is my tribe. I am literally, whenever I go to a conference, I am part of my tribe. It's like Morocco. I've been to Colombia, Brazil. It's like Asia. It's like China, Singapore, Cambodia, Thailand. I've been to South Africa. I've been to Morocco, Canary Island, everywhere. And I've never been alone. I've always had someone from my tribe there with me. They speak different languages. It's like, and I am telling you this, another thing that we have to worry about with our tribe is we let the pettiness get involved and we forget that they are part of our tribe. I have friends that I am proud to say that I have shared meals with in Moscow and St. Petersburg. They are still my friends and I still care for them just like I care for my friends in Kiev. 
and in Ukraine. It's like, it doesn't matter that, and, and I gave a talk in 2021 dragging Putin about freaking uh, invading illegally the Ukraine. And I had some Russian friends that were upset with my stance on that. And I'm like, mother, did you hear me in 2003 when I was screaming about freaking George W. Bush's illegal war in Iraq? It's like, well, then don't get mad at me when, when your guy does it. I was pretty pissed off when our guy did it. It's like, and that's the whole point. That doesn't matter because you're there for the people. I've given conferences in Saudi Arabia and Tel Aviv, Israel. Been to Beirut, Lebanon. It's like I have friends in Palestine and Iran. It's like, and I have friends all over the U.S. and even Canada. Right, Canadian. But it's like that. that it's just one of those things. I literally have friends everywhere because they're part of my tribe. And we have to remember that. And one, and that's what Death Country is about. Because you know what your tribe is. And it's like, and when you come to DEF CON, DEF CON is huge. There's so many people. I can't do everything at one time. Exactly. But you can find your sub tribe. Because DEF CON gives you that tent, that meeting place. And it says, come to the desert. It's like, come to here and find your tribe and find your connection. You can spend your whole time at DEF CON in the wireless village if you love Wi-Fi hacking. You like hardware hacking? Ba-boom. Cryptography, ba-boom. Evidence tampering, you horrible person. No, ba-boom, there's a village for that as well. Social engineering, it's like car hacking, satellite hacking. That's what it's about, finding other members of your tribe. And then DEF CON groups gives you something even better. It gives you to find another subgroup, that local geographical ethnicity connection you have with your tribe and meet with them and have that connection with them when you're at your home. And we need to remember that. It's like DEF CON is not just coming into Vegas and getting badges and getting swag and going to parties. It's like, and getting selfies. It is about connecting with your tribe and realizing when you're at home and when you think no one else knows what you go through or what you're trying to develop or what you're trying to think or how you think and no one gets that, you're not alone. There's others of your tribe here and you can find them in your own city and you don't have to be alone there either. And that's what we need to get into and remember about our ethnicity and our tribe of a hacker. One of the tags that I wanted to start getting, I'm going to get printed on a t-shirt once I notify Casey, Casey, this is your notification, uh, is that I want, I'm getting a DEF CON groups t-shirt made. And it's literally going to say hacker tribe worldwide, because that's what it's about. It's about us understanding that with that ethnicity, with that way of thinking about our tribe, that brings us together. Every single person in this room is exactly alike in my eyes. They're part of my tribe. That's all. It's like, I don't know where you're from. Some of you could be feds. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it doesn't matter. I look at it, it's like, oh, there you go. It's like, I'm just saying, it doesn't matter you're still part of my tribe. Now, here comes the, you know, I, I, I hope I gave you some nice stuff, but there's another part of that tribe. They're the people I don't like. There are people at this conference who don't like me. There are people, and, and let's, let's, let's be specifically honest here. There are people at this conference that have reason and, and actual cause not to like me. And that's okay. They're still part of my tribe. There are people here that I totally disrespect. I mean, I met a guy last night walking in the halls, we were doing some stuff. He, was there. he wasn't worth my acknowledgement. Once 
I don't get vengeful. I get forgetful. He didn't exist in my world. I just literally blacked him out and didn't even like acknowledge his existence because it wasn't worth my time. It's like, but you know, one thing that I can't deny that he's part of my tribe. You got people here that voted differently than you. They're part of your tribe. There are people here that love differently than you. They're part of your tribe. There are people here that think differently and worship differently than you. They are still part of your tribe. But with that being said, the ones that do wrong, the ones that do harm, well, there's a thing that tribes do too, and they shun. You can be shunned from your tribe. You can be shunned by your tribe in saying, yes, I acknowledge that you're a part of my tribe, but you do not represent us and you don't belong here because of what you do or how you act. You don't deserve to be in our tribe anymore. You are an outcast. You think that we are like, we all like to be the rejects and the outcasts and that's great. It's like, I've never wanted to be a cool kid and I cringe everybody time people treat me like one. It's like, but most, I am not an outcast among my tribe. And that's okay. But if you do bad by someone, if you are one of these people that have gone to these tribes and it's DC 414, right? Because when I come at you, mother, I come at you with receipts. DC 414 doesn't exist anymore. They don't deserve to exist anymore. The people who ran that DEF CON group do not deserve to be having that name in their mouth anymore. They have lost that right. And I personally shun that. And I am telling you this right now. If I see anyone at this conference on a street corner in Brazil who mistreats another human being, downgrades another person, makes anyone uncomfortable with who they are by a joke or a look or a come on, I'm coming for you. I will say something. There have been times where I've been embarrassed because I misinterpreted a situation where I thought someone was having a problem and they weren't. And that was embarrassing. Too bad. I'm going to do it again the next time I see something like that. We don't have a choice to not say something. We don't have a choice as hackers to not protect, not just the people in our tribe, but anyone. Because as far as I'm concerned, that is something that hackers do. Because if that's not something we do, then I wouldn't want to be a hacker. But one of the reasons we're a hacker is because when we see something wrong, we try to fix it. Everybody out there can say that we're aligned like criminals or that we're all about breaking things. Look, no hacker here has ever created a vulnerability in someone else's system or program. They just showed them the flaw that was always there. While the criminal kept their mouth shut and exploited it. We will talk and say, this is not right. So you need to understand that when you see something wrong, through this, see something, say something. No, no, you see something, you start something. That doesn't belong here at DEF CON. That doesn't belong in any functioning society. And notice, I didn't say, oh, if, if you see a girl being uh, hurt or, or attacked, or 
Screw that. It's not about gender. It's like no matter where on the spectrum you are on gender. It's about an effing human. And I don't have to have offspring or siblings or parents to know that that's wrong. It's another human being. We need to start treating them like we want to be treated. So get that through it. It's like, start being uncomfortable. Start understanding that part of functioning in a tribe is taking responsibility for protecting that tribe and protecting the people who can't fight for themselves sometimes and shunning the mother who deserve it and don't deserve to be in our tribe. Stop being so consumed about how another person looks, what their genitalia look like, it's like, or who they're loving or who they worship to or don't. Why does that matter? They are still part of your tribe. And that is what it's about. I will fight for every single one of you without not even knowing who you are or who you voted for or who you pray to because it doesn't effing matter. You're part of my tribe and you're a human being, so therefore you are worthy of that protection. Start understanding that. Start standing up for the ones that can't. You have a voice, effing use it for the ones who don't. I've told people in several different talks, what's the use of me having white male privilege if I can't get up on a freaking podium and tell people why it's so bad to have it? Because that is the only use for white privilege is to be able to get a, on a podium and tell people and make them uncomfortable when you tell them that you shouldn't have it. Start making people uncomfortable because that makes them think and start protecting those who can't. Start speaking for those who don't have a voice. And mother, and before you speak, make sure you're listening. Because there's a lot of people out there that are doing too much of the talking and not enough of the listening to the people who are trying to talk and trying to explain what's going on. It's like, this whole two sides to a, uh, every story, like DC 414 likes to spin, screw that noise. The earth is not flat. That's not a differing opinion I'm going to argue about with it. I am not going to waste my time trying to explain to you how snow globes work or telescopes. I mean, I'm not going to. You're wrong. You do something that is so blatantly, obviously misogynistic and sexist, I am not going to wait to hear your opinion or how you interpret it. Mother, you're wrong. Done. End of story. No need to discussion. You start ostracizing someone because they have a different suntan built in at birth than you do. Look, that's wrong. There is no discussion. There is no, oh, well, he had some valid points or he's like, oh, maybe he's, and, and this, and I will tell you a story and I'm going to end it on this, is that I had my youngest child come to me. It's like, and they said that they were at school back in 2021 or so, 2020, and they were getting harassed by a student because the mask they wore had in sign language with different shades of hands that just spelled out BLM. And the student said, well, I've been uh, subject to racism too, as a white person. So what about that? What do you say about that? This, my child was 15 or 16. I'm not a good father. It's like they're, they're around that age, right? And it's like, and what they said, because they think, because they know how to do conduct a reading, I didn't have a good answer. 
I didn't really know exactly. So could you explain to me why is it different? And I had to explain to them. I, as me, you know, Mr. McWhitey person here, it's like I've experienced racism when I've been in China. Try getting a cab looking like this at 10 o'clock in Beijing. It's not going to happen. Take the effing subway. Because that's exactly what I did after about 30, 45 minutes seeing the taxi going, oh, I don't know about that. Like, nope. But it's like, you know, I had a hoodie on. It's like, I was, when I was in Cairo, Egypt, I got a very uncomfortable wife by some of the guys that were looking at me on an overpass and I hurried on my way. That is called individual racism. I've experienced individual racism. I explained to my youngest child what they were talking about with the only, that systemic racism, meaning that the system that is built in this country is geared to be easier for you and harder for someone else. And that is the reason why that matters. That is the reason why that protest is different. It's not because of this, it's because of this. And then I gave them homework to go look about, go research redlining. And what redlining was, what the government did with redlining, it's like uh, back in the 50s for home grants. So I'm gonna explain why the Industrial Revolution stopped in the 1970s. Start looking at those things and understand what that means. Don't take my word for it. Do the research. But know when I say something with conviction, I have effing receipts. So understand that as well. So when I say that you're a part of my tribe, I mean it. When I say I care about you without ever having seen you before, I mean it. And that's the way you should be treating every other single member of your tribe and also anyone that's outside of your tribe. Every time I have the opportunity to talk to someone who thinks a hacker is a criminal, who doesn't understand what hacker means, that is an opportunity for me to educate them, for me to show them by my actions and my words what it means to be a member of my tribe and represent them properly not with condensation not condensation condemnation there you go high school dropped out back off it's like so it's like i get to show them that and let them understand that i don't look down to them i am always going to be a noob here stop acting like that that's a dirty word I don't know how to program. That doesn't make me less of a hacker. I don't know how to drop a SQL database. I've walked out with SQL servers from the server room. Screw your SQL injections. We are all hackers. We all belong here. If you are at this conference more than anywhere else in the world, if this is your first day experience, if you walked off the street and you decided to buy a ticket because it looked cool, guess what, mother? You're a hacker and you belong here. If you've been doing your own thing for 40 years and decided to get into information security and get into hacking and you've never done it before, and you were the food industry or you were in accounting but you're trying to give this a try and you're trying to bring look congratulations you're a hacker i was the best janitor at mcdonald's for two years in a row we got awards in the southeast texas region it's in my mother bio on my website because i was an effing good janitor i didn't want to be a janitor all my life but anything I did, I did as well as I could do. Stop trying to look down on other people because of their other professions or what they're trying to do. They're effing hackers and they're trying to learn. Teach or get out of the effing way. We are hackers and we are supposed to help. 
And if you can't understand those concepts, but you think you can understand, it's like how I CCPIP works, then I shun you because you don't, you're not worth my time. And you're not worth being part of my tribe. And that's what that is about. We are a tribe and a tribe has responsibility, not just to themselves, but to each other and to those outside. Start acting like it, people, and go back to your cities and find your tribe there. And if you don't have a DEF CON group in your city, why aren't you starting one? Find your tribe. Don't just wait to DEF CON to provide that home for you. It's like create that space, create that tribe in your local city and give people who've never heard of DEF CON understanding that they're not alone and that they can find people like them in their tribe. Because that's what we should be doing. Helping others in our tribe and helping other people find our tribe so they can find out where they belong. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason, for your presentation. Uh, I please make sure you show his appreciation. There's a way of laughing. Let me see. Yeah, there's some way of doing that. Um, everyone, uh, 800XL is going to have to translate what's going on because I can't hear y'all breaking up. But someone had a question about getting clarity on uh, GC414. Uh, so I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to explain uh, from a question that we had y'all about what happened to DC414 that made me so upset uh, because one of the primary contacts one of the like elders of that local tribe it's like it's representing DC414 because it was on their badge had a very inappropriate and that's all it has to be said very misogynistic very sexist badge that if you didn't have to have or identify as a woman to be offended by you didn't have to say oh well i have a daughter or i have a screw that noise it's like you didn't have to know those things to be offended by and instead of properly and doing the right human thing of saying wow you're right that is i'm that was insensitive i was stupid i should have thought that through i'm an idiot person who was like an idiot and i do idiot things because i think it's going to get me attention because i'm sad and i feel pathetic and so i'm trying to get even bad attention because that's all my mommy and daddy gave me well it's like instead of being honest about it they decide to lean into that horrible behavior they decided that it was cool that they were getting that kind of stuff. They weren't repentant about it. It's like, and so we, and, and they try to keep making it worse. So DEF CON, which does this very rarely, had to officially disband that group. Their leaders are still trying to cause problems and they're doing death threats and causing chaos in that region because they think they can and they can get away with it because the people who don't have voices are being subjugated and they don't think that other people with bigger voices are gonna call those motherfuckers out by name if I have to, which I will if it keeps up. It's like they're lucky I'm just keeping it to DC414. If they want names, I will give names. It's like, because you can come at me. My address is all over the internet. It's not that hard, buddy. I've been doxxed before. Come at me, bro. Let's see what happens. Because don't think Mr. Adorable is always adorable. I am tired of people thinking it's comfortable to be able to threaten other people and that those people are just going to back down. I don't 
back down. And it's not cancel culture, which they like to scream. It's called consequence culture. Back in the day, no one had a voice to explain why it was wrong. And now all of a sudden, people are actually getting voices and being able to like say, no, you can't represent us like that. You can't represent situations like this. This is offensive to me. This is offensive to, to most general human beings. So you can't do this anymore. That's not being canceled. That is understanding that you have the freedom of speech, but you are not free of consequences. And that is what happened to DC 414 and the despicable, disgusting, pathetic leaders of that group who think that, that it was okay for the lulls and okay to make other people uncomfortable if it brought them happiness. That it's okay to threaten one's family or threaten other people. It's like, because it makes them feel powerful and their little pathetic little world or viewpoint. Any other questions? <laughs>